In today's video, I'm showing you 10 ways to use Code Interpreter inside of ChatGPT. Hopefully, you can bring this back to the workplace and impress your colleagues, your boss, or even yourself in some cases. Let's get into it. Before we jump into these tips, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to turn Code Interpreter on. You can click on these three dots, go to Settings, Beta Features, and turn on Code Interpreter. If you don't have a paid account, this won't be here for you most likely. Then you'll need to switch to GPT-4 and turn on Code Interpreter. You'll notice that this little plus button shows up once you turn on Code Interpreter. This allows you to upload files to ChatGPT. The first way that you can use Code Interpreter is turning links into QR codes. So it's this simple, guys. You just have to paste a link and say, turn this link into a red QR code. Let's see if it can turn it red. I haven't tried this yet. I'm going to send the message. Okay, so it appears that it had a few issues trying to create a red QR code. In fact, it told me that it couldn't even generate QR codes yet. But what I typed in next made it work. So I just said, turn my link into a QR code using Python. And because ChatGPT is so proficient in Python, I just pasted my link and then it went to work generating that QR code for me. Now let's go ahead and see if this works. Okay, I've got my phone right here. I'm just gonna open up my camera and let's go ahead and scan that QR code. Oh, it does work. Look at that. We have my YouTube channel on my scratched up, nasty looking phone. I'm sorry about that. On to the next tip. With Code Interpreter, you can create some really beautiful looking stuff. Let's go ahead and data visualize a map of the zip codes in the US. What I'm going to say is create a heat map of the zip codes in the United States by population density. Use a blue and red scale for this blue being low population red being high population code interpreter is on let's go ahead and send this off okay so in this mode ChatGPT does not have access to the internet so it's going to stop us right here and the reason that i still show these examples is because most normal people that are using ChatGPT are going to run into issues like this too and i'm going to show you how you can get around them so what it says here is that we need to upload some data and it actually gives us a very clear roadmap of what it needs it needs the zip codes and the population density. So I'm gonna go over and find this data for it right now. So it turns out there's a whole lot more zip codes in the United States than I wanna try to put in ChatGPT. So what I did is I just went ahead and grabbed the Michigan zip codes, which is my home state, and I put them inside of a Google Sheet here, cleaned up this data, and now I'm just gonna go ahead and hit File, Download. We're gonna download it as a CSV because Python handles CSV really well. Now I'm just going to upload this file. I'm going to say I want to see a geo map of Michigan with the zip codes in a heat map like I mentioned above, not the entire United States. Can you do this for me? I'm going to send that off. And it appears that it noticed that my data is in these fields in a weird way. So I have the zip code and the population in one field, the way that the data came through. So it's cleaning that up now for me. As you can see, it's already done that. So it's got density, zip code, and population. And wow, would you look at that? We finally got it to work. Here are all of the zip codes and the proper coloring for each of them. It did take a bit of finessing, but ChatGPT was very good at explaining exactly what it needed so that I could go out and find it and upload it. And then it even was able to extract Michigan out of all of the USA zip code boundaries in a zip file that I uploaded. This is very impressive, but I would say that this scale is very heavy on the blue. I wanna see more of this red on this scale so that I can see a little bit more of the variance here. I know that the variance is really strong in some of these areas, and that's why it's showing this white here. But I'm just going to say, turn the middle of the scale to red as well but lighter and make the scale smaller so that more red shows up i'm gonna hit enter wow this is much better look at this guys it's coming through amazing now i can see all of these areas that are super red near detroit and grand rapids kalamazoo area and we can even see some little anomalies up here in the up let's see what it comes up with if i simply ask it to create an animation in lo-fi grid style of fireworks exploding on click using python make the firework colors either 
red, white, or blue. Do this on a 250 by 250 grid window. Make sure that on click, the location creates a simple firework animation. Let's see if it can do this. So it looks like this may have worked, but what it wants me to do here is it wants me to run this pip install pi game in my command line. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. I'm going to paste it into my command prompt and hit enter, and it's going to install pi game. Now over here, I'm just going to paste my code into this text file, and I'm going to turn it into a Python file that I can run on my computer. Actually, I'll just hit copy code, paste it here. We're going to hit file, save as, and I know that I need to put quotes around this if I want it to work. So let's just put quotes around this so that it keeps it as a Python file. And then I'm just going to copy Copy the name fireworks game dot pi and I'll actually put underscore in there. We'll make it all lowercase just to be safe. I'm gonna copy that and hit save. Next, I'm gonna type in CD desktop. And this will bring me to my desktop where this fireworks game is located. I'm just gonna ask, how do I run the fireworks game? And it's going to tell me to install Python, install pi game, which I've already done. We've created the Python file. And now as you can see, it tells us to type in Python and then type in the file name once you're on the desktop here. So let's go ahead and type that in right here, Python, then paste fireworks underscore game dot pi and hit enter. And as you can see, it's popped up this window and let's just click around a little bit. As you can see, it's populating these little random blobs. And although they might not look like perfect fireworks, I would say it's pretty neat and they're getting bigger as it goes. Next, let's see if ChatGPT can actually edit photos. I've seen some people doing this on Twitter. I wanna see if it's possible for me. And at the end of this, I wanna see if I can turn it into a GIF and have it be like zooming in and out and whatnot. So what I'm going to do is just upload a photo. I need to be on GPT-4 code interpreter. I want you to turn this photo black and white. Let's see if it can do that. I'm going to upload a photo that I got off of Unsplash. And right now, as you can see, it's this orange and black color. I want it to be black and white. So let's head over to send a message, send it off. All right, let's see if this works. Boom, as you can see, it has actually worked. It turned the image into a black and white image, which is very cool that it can now do this. This is very intuitive. Now let's say use this image to create a GIF that is 10 frames. I want it to slowly zoom in. Let's try that. Okay, so it looks like I've worn out my welcome with ChatGPT. Let's come back later. All right, so we've waited and ChatGPT is back up and running now. So what I'm going to do next is see if I can create a GIF. Let's head over to ChatGPT4, Code Interpreter, and let's go ahead and drag this image into here. And this is just a wood texture. I'm just going to say, turn this image into a lower resolution version so it's easier to process. Then start zoomed in on the left side and pan to the right side of the image. Turn this into a .gif and allow me to download it. It's asking me for how many frames I want the GIF to be just for clarification, which is kind of nice that it's doing that and it's not just assuming, it's actually wanting to get some good details. I'm just gonna type in 15 frames. As you can see, I can open this up and I can see the work as it's parsing out these frames. All right, and now it's provided the download. So let's go ahead and try this out. All right, and here we are. We have the GIF and it actually appears to be working. Although it is crawling at pretty much a snail's pace and it seems really uh, low resolution and kind of like slow and laggy, that's because of the nature of this file and the fact that it's fitting this pan into 15 frames. I would still say that it's pretty impressive that a language model can take that basic prompt that I gave it and turn it into something tangible like this. It's going to be incredible once it can do this with an image in mid-journey or something like that and turn that into a GIF or a video. Next, I'm going to show you these mind-blowing radar charts that you can build out using ChatGPT. But first, you need something to compare on a few different dimensions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask ChatGPT to categorize my videos into five different buckets. And then I'm going to have it generate a radar chart based on that. Let's go ahead and upload my Productive Dude YouTube data. Then I'm just going to say, parse out the top five video topics based on the video titles. I want to put these videos into five buckets. 
mainly based on the software being used. Then total up views, watch time, subscribers, estimated revenue, and click-through rate for each bucket slash topic. After that, put each dimension for each of the buckets in a radar chart. One for click-through, one for estimated revenue, one for subscribers, watch time, and views. Each metric will compare the top five buckets on their totals using radar charts. That was pretty long-winded, but let's see if we can get some beautiful looking radar charts using this prompt. Okay, so it's asking me about the other specific names that I want them to look for. So I'm just going to include Miro, Midjourney, Trello, Notion. Let's also add Coda and ClickUp as well. And I added here, I know I included a few extras. Please include all of these buckets. Let's hit enter. All right, now we get these beautiful radar charts. One for views, watch time, subscribers, estimated revenue, and impressions click-through rate. You'll notice that in most cases, it favors Notion on estimated revenue, subscribers, watch time, and views. These are all metrics that are basically going to favor Notion because I've just made a lot more Notion videos. They've gotten more views, and with more views, you're going to increase all of these metrics. But one of the metrics that is getting a little bit of a different result here is impressions to click-through rate. As you can see, my impression to click-through rate is really high for something like Trello in comparison to the other tools. You'll also notice that Notions is average or lower end compared to some of these other tools. This just goes to show that my Trello thumbnails and titles are really striking a chord with my audience. And I would say the same is true with Miro and potentially ClickUp. Midjourney could use some work. Another neat thing about this is it's going to include some information and it basically just reiterates what I said. Notion generally performs best across all metrics. Miro has relatively high watch time and estimated revenue compared to others but falls behind views and subscribers Let's see what it means by that watch time is a bit higher for Mira. i suppose there's a bit of a jut there but it's definitely not as high as notion because notion just dwarfs it but i do see the little uh climb that it has i am curious to see what happens if i exclude notion from the data let's regenerate all of these categories but exclude notion and let's also exclude mid-journey and here we are with a more varied looking radar chart this is now showing Trello, Miro, and ClickUp, and it gives me a much better idea of where everything compares to itself. This is an interesting way to see that Miro is leading in views and Trello is next up. And ClickUp follows in third place. Radar charts can be very helpful to generate, but if you're not a data scientist, this could have been a lot harder before. Next, let's see if Code Interpreter can create the game Snake. All right, now let's go ahead and install this Windows Curses. And let's go ahead and grab our code, paste this code. Now I'm going to hit file, save as, and we're going to name it snake.py. I'm gonna hit save. And as you can see, it has generated a very simple game of snake here with these little pi numbers and I'm able to use it. I'm using my arrows right now. So this game could go on for quite a while before I fail because there's just so much room here, but it's pretty neat that a couple simple prompts could get us this far along. Now let's dive into another thing that Code Interpreter is really good at, and that is formatting your data. Here we are inside of a Google Sheet and we just have one column called name right here, and that includes first and last name. I'm going to go ahead and hit file, save as a CSV. We'll just call it names and I'll hit save. And now I'm just going to go ahead and upload that file. I'm just going to say split the name column into first and last. And as you can see, it continues to spit this out. But what I want is I want a fresh CSV that I can download. So I'm just going to say finish all of the names and then allow me to download a CSV with the new names formatted in it. All right, let's go ahead and download this and see if it works. All right, so we've gone ahead and opened up the names right here. And as you can see, it's kept that initial name column, but it's also created a first and last name column now. Next, I'm going to upload my top Spotify songs between 2017 and 2022. 
and see what Code Interpreter can come up with in terms of a data visualization for my music taste. If you can download your data from Spotify, they give you lots of interesting data about your music taste. I used exportify.net to get my data. Let's go ahead and tell ChatGPT what we're going to try to do here. I'm going to be uploading my top songs from 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, and 2022, along with some useful data related to them. Create 10 interesting data visualizations with the data inside. Please just respond with upload next until you have all of the sheets. Here's 2017. 2018 will follow. And when I get to 2022, start generating the 10 interesting data visualizations for my cumulative music over all the years. All right, I'm dragging in 2017. Now let's go ahead and hit send message. It should say upload next, which it does. Let's go ahead and upload 2018 next. And it's still good. 2019, 2020, 2021, and finally 2022. Let's see if it works when I hit send message. Wow, look at that. So it was able to count all of these files until I finally came to 2022. So I don't know if it came upon this conclusion that this is 2022 based on this title or based on how many I said I was going to upload in the order that I said I was going to upload them, but it has gone into work now on 2022. So that's amazing. So here are the 10 visualizations that they are going to create. So it says, let's start creating the visualizations. Please note the data must contain the relevant columns for these visualizations to be created. If some columns like genres are not present, we may need to adjust the visualization accordingly. Let's go, let's do it. And now it's going to work writing out all of these visualizations. And wow, look at that. It's actually pulled in my top popular artists from 2017 up to 2022, cumulatively added them together and put them in this nice list here. It's also given me the highs and lows for danceability scores along with the averages. Over the years, it appears that tempo has slowly increased, or at least the maximum tempo has slowly increased. I've also got a much wider range on 2022. We were all the way up here to 200 beats per minute, and we were lower than 60 beats per minute at one point. All of these candle wick type charts are pretty neat, but I want to go ahead and create some different charts. So let's go ahead and create some radar charts. I'm just going to say create a radar chart of each of these so I can see the dimensions based upon year. And boom, as you can see, we now have a beautiful radar chart that shows us all over the map where we're at in terms of our loudness, energy, danceability, tempo, instrumentalness, acousticness, and speechiness. You'll notice that 2019 was our most acoustic year, while 2021 was the most danceable year. Next, I'm going to upload some data that I've collected using my Aura Ring, which is a sleep tracking and activity tracking wearable that I wear on my hand pretty much every day that I get a chance. So I've gone ahead and created a file from all the way back to 2019 to present day. And I'm gonna go ahead and upload this with a few of my sleep stats. All right, my Aura trends are updating and I'm just going to say, create some data visualizations for my Aura Ring data showing how my results have varied over time. This is weekly average data. I'm going to hit enter. All right, so it's asking me which specific metrics I'm most interested in. These are the ones that I've imported into here. So I'm just going to say create a radar chart with all of the metrics on it for each year. I'll put the averages for the metrics. All right, let's see what that does. Okay, the radar chart is pretty interesting for this, but I also wanna see steps on a bar chart. So let's go ahead and just say, let's see a bar chart with all the weekly steps data. Wow, this is pretty incredible. It actually imported pretty much all of the steps data, I think, for each week. So as you can see, my steps have gone down and it's actually because 
I don't wear my aura ring as much. And to be honest, I probably don't run as much as I used to either. So this is kind of an interesting chart to see how my steps have decreased over time. But it looks like they are kind of starting to pick back up out of this middle low right here. Now let's go ahead and see our average HRV on a line chart. I can get a really good idea of what my average heart rate variability is throughout the years. This is going to be really interesting to look back on when I have 10, 20, or even 30 years of data. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and leave a like, comment below, and subscribe for more content like this. If you enjoyed this video, you'll probably enjoy this video as well.